Uh, good afternoon, everyone, Homeless Task Force members. Happy Monday to you. Thanks for continuing to make this a priority and attend and participate in conversations. Appreciate your commitment to our city in this fashion. And I hope you're ready for a great afternoon again. Hopefully get towards some action today and further conversation. But thanks for your commitment. I know that Rebecca can't be with us today, and I believe Terry's going to be here, maybe running a few minutes late. But we'll go ahead and get started. We've got some guests with us today, so I want to be respectful of their time as well. Our agenda is pretty straightforward today. We're going to listen to a couple of some information, and then after that, we're going to have some open discussion on a potential pathway forward. So to get us started today, though, we've got a new uh, staff, I don't know if he's new anymore, but uh, staff member from the City of Sioux Falls Housing Department, Logan Penfield, is going to share with us about the housing strategy for the City of Sioux Falls, uh, Accessible Housing Advisory Board, give us an overview of their work, how that impacts what we're working on today. After he talks, there'll be plenty of time for questions and conversation as well. Logan, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Uh, I put together a presentation here. Uh, I'll hopefully keep it to a little bit the shorter end and not drift as, as long as I've gone a couple times with it. Uh, over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give you an overview on the responsibilities, purpose, uh, and just general overview of the uh, Accessible Housing Advisory Board, or AHAB, uh, the City of Sioux Falls Housing Programs, City of Sioux Falls Partnerships, Sioux Falls Households and house Housing Needs by Income Level, Examination of the City of Sioux Falls Housing Programs and Partnerships by Income Level, and a short conclusion. For starters, the oversight of the Sioux Falls Housing uh, Division is the Accessible Housing Advisory Board. Uh, AHAB is a voluntary board formed as a cooperative effort between the City of Sioux Falls, the Sioux Falls School District, and Minnehaha and Lincoln Counties. The committee works towards the creation of accessible housing, housing stabilization services, and alleviating homelessness. The board may advise the City of Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County governing boards regarding housing, housing services, homeless po and homeless population in the Sioux Falls area. AHAB was created as a joint cooperative effort toward, towards creation of affordable housing, housing stabilization services, and alleviating homelessness in the greater Sioux Falls area and in Minnehaha County. The cooperative agreement signed by the City of Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County dissolved the previously existing Homeless Advisory Board and created the Accessible Housing Advisory Board to focus on accessible housing, supportive services, and homelessness. That cooperative agreement was signed on May 8, 2020. Purpose. Ahab's purpose is to become familiar with the housing and homeless needs of the greater Sioux Falls area and in Minnehaha County specifically, and available resources to address these needs. To evaluate relative need and community benefit of projects funded under the Housing Division in the City of Sioux Falls with federal grant funds from the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, and home funds along with local general fund dollars. To prepare and endorse an, its annual federal action plan and subgrantees and such other related purposes as may be necessary or beneficial to further the cause of providing affordable housing and housing supportive services and reducing or eliminating homelessness in the greater Sioux Falls area. Responsibilities of the board. To advise the housing division on housing issues, strategies, goals, and policies. To study and recommend to the housing division long and short-term goals, ordinances, funding priorities and programs to address recognized housing needs, to develop and recommend with community input innovative approaches to accomplish the city's housing goals, including tools for preserving existing housing, to advise the housing division concerning the impacts of city policy proposals on affordable housing, to review regional housing issues and make recommendations to the housing division, to advise the Housing Division concerning an appropriate advocacy role for the city in state and federal matters, to consult and coordinate 
with local housing committees and other city boards and commissions to develop and support city, the city's housing efforts, to recommend action to the Sioux Falls City Council and Minnehaha County Commission, and to monitor the overall development and execution of the city's CDBG and home programs. Membership of the board will consist of 11 members, including a member of the city council, Sioux Falls City Council, a member of Mini the Minnehaha County Commission, a member of the Lincoln County Commission, a member of the Sioux Falls School District, the housing manager for the city of Sioux Falls, a member of the Minnehaha County staff, and five, at, five citizens at large who must be residents of Minnehaha County. Now we shift to the City of Sioux Falls housing programs. The City of Sioux Falls receives annual funding from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, in accordance with federal guidelines and its annual action plan to implement community housing interventions and address issues prioritized in various community engagement and gap analysis. For 2022, the City of Sioux Falls received $1.027 million in CDBG dollars and $560,000 in home funds to implement community housing interventions. With these federal dollars, the City will work with partners to construct 15 additional affordable housing units, rehab 35 single-family homes, six mobile home units will be re rehabilitated, 60 low-income households will receive case management and stable housing, for rapid rehousing through ICAP. 15 low-income households will benefit from access accessibility modifications, and three low-income households will benefit from accessibility modifications to rental units. For long-term planning, we just heard about our annual action plan for this year, which we have to submit to HUD annually. Our long-term plan is the 2026 Housing, a housing Action Plan. This was put together and presented to the City Council in January, um, following about six months of consultations and discussion through AHAB. This was two large stakeholder meetings, as well as a handful of other meetings throughout the community during 2021 that led to this being put together. To accomplish the annual action plan and to follow the 2026 Housing Action Plan, the City of Sioux Falls administers and partners on housing intervention programs. For housing programs administered through the City of Sioux Falls, we have the Neighborhood Safety Grant Program, the Single Family Rehabilitation Program, the Neighborhood Revitalization Program, the Rental Rehabilitation Program, the Home Mobile Home Repair, and Public Safety Down Payment Assistance Program. The city also has individual strategic par partnerships, uh, generally under $20,000 um, that are not included in this. And annually we have any, a handful of different one-off projects, which could be for-profit or non-profit partners that come together to work on that. For strategic partnerships, the city works with affordable housing solutions the Southeastern Development Foundation, SEDF, the Habitat for Humanity, Sioux Falls Development Foundation, private developers, Minnehaha County, when we just talked that about our uh, recent, recent TIF, the single family housing TIF that went through, uh, went to the city council a couple weeks ago and will receive its second re reading, I think it's two weeks from now. Um, that also has to go through the county commission. Additionally, we partner with ICAP, or Interlakes Community Action Partnership. They've got a couple different programs, and if you look at um, the handout that I created for you, um, two of the biggest programs that are under, under the 50% AMI are actually ICAP administered. Bishop Dudley House and Children's Inn. And again, this is not a comprehensive list of uh, every, every non or for-profit developer or um, partner that we have. This is an annual uh, partnership that we have with these nonprofits um, to have uh, 
a general impact on housing. Quick uh, overview of city administered housing programs. These are ones that our housing program specialists actually administer um, in Sioux Falls here. The Neighborhood Safety Grant Program. This is a $5,000 grant to individuals at 65% uh, AMI or below to make needed, change, or, um, needed um, rehabilitations to their housing units. Uh, many individuals that access the $5,000 grant are then automatically qualified for our single family rehab program, which I'll talk about in a second. The single family rehab program is, is focused at 80% AMI and below to individuals who own their house. And this is a secondary um, deferred loan at 0% interest. And these loans can be used to repair or replace plumbing, heating and cooling systems, electrical, uh, a, a worn or leaking roof, windows and screens, insulation and w wet winterization, handicap accessibility, uh, or necessary painting. So this is the main goal of this program and, and the, the grant is to avoid homes falling into dilapidation. We want to maintain that housing stock even if the individual who owns the home can't afford to do the needed updates uh, at this time. We use CDBG dollars for the single rehabilitation, single family rehabilitation program. We get ongoing funding from HUD to, to do this program. And then when these houses are sold later on, we recapture those funds. Now there's zero interest on there. So we recapture the original amount, but we put that money back into the program as programmatic income so that we can keep increasing uh, the impact of the program moving forward. Neighborhood revitalization. Um, this is local and federal tax dollars. So for the most part, we use our home funds on this. We do use some city funds because of the flexibility that comes with that. Um, but we work with affordable housing solutions uh, for the acquisition and development of affordable housing within not just core areas. We, we try to target core areas with certain uh, grant funding we get from the feds, but for the most part, it's wherever they can find land that's suitable for twin home development, which is largely what they do currently. And so they develop housing that's sold at, sold to individuals 80% AMI or below. And we put in home funds and some city funds to buy down the price of that so that those individuals can afford it. And then that comes with a standard 10-year affordability period that's tied to the deed on those houses. So if an individual sells it after six years, they can't sell it for a true market rate. It can only increase the, um, the average of the, the housing price index over that period of time. So it closely tracks market rate, but it does cap it somewhat. We have a rental rehabilitation program. This program provides owners of registered rental property, low interest loans uh, for materials used in the interior or exterior of a rehabilitation. The maximum loan for this is $100,000. And this program is, is uh, funded by state flex dollars. So we apply for these dollars from the state. The state sends us a pot of uh, money to administer this program. Um, and it's capped at $100,000. The goal is to get some of these uh, smaller rental units to be brought more up to date and also not falling into dilapidation, right? It's a low interest loan, it's over eight years, it's capped at $100,000. For the most part, we haven't gone up to that amount. It's typically significantly lower than that, but as interest rates are increasing, we're starting to see um, more applications for higher dollars amount for the state flex dollars on that. We have a mobile home repair program that program provides financial assistance to low and moderate income residents who own a mobile home within the city of Sioux Falls limits and need financial assistance to maintain that mobile home to a decent, safe, and sanitary condition. This is a $5,000 forgiv forgivable loan, and uh, individuals are restricted at 80% of area and median income to qualify for that. We use CDBG funds to fund this program as well. The Public Safety Down Payment Assistance Program is a little bit different. Um, this program offers assistance 
for home ownership within core areas of the city. I think it's the technical term is qualified census tract. Qualified census tracts are socially vulnerable areas, which essentially is the core of Sioux Falls, and it offers a up to $20,000 uh, forgivable loan for uh, police officers, firefighters, and public safety employees. I say this is, is a little bit different because this is a down payment assistance type of program for those individuals looking to transition into home ownership and try to get our first responders to be able to afford to live in the city and not have to live outside of it. Before we get into the, the housing gaps, I think it's important for us to understand population growth by AMI over the last decade within the city of Sioux Falls. This slide um, comes from uh, the, the housing study that we, we did with Augustana uh, that was completed last year. <clears throat> Between 2010 and 2019, population growth in Sioux Falls was not equally distributed. The number of households in upper income brackets increased while households in the lower income brackets largely stayed the same. So the growth that we had was largely 50% AMI, or, sorry, $50,000 and above. So specific to our current discussion, above is a spreadsheet of Sioux Falls households by median family income. In your handout, you have a breakdown of city programs and partnerships broken down by AMI population and assists. Specific to this task force, I want to highlight that 11.7% of the total population was under 30% MFI on average between 2010 and 2019. To serve that population, there was a need for 8,065 total housing units as of 2020. And additionally, over the past five years, the annual point in time count for people experiencing homelessness has recorded over 300 people on average who are unsheltered or in emergency services on a single night in January. That includes domestic violence shelters. And for 2022, so the, the survey was done the last Tuesday in January uh, of every year. So for in January 2022, the count was 407 total people that were either unsheltered or in emergency shelter services or domestic, or, uh, domestic violence shelter. On the next slide, you'll see the current income limits by AMI for families and individuals to qualify for HUD assisted programs. This was updated in June of this year. Currently 100% AMI for a family of four in Sioux Falls is $90,700. And for an individual, that's 63490 For most of the programs we administer in Sioux Falls, uh, the, the max AMI an individual or a family can be is 80%. So for a family of four, that's $72,550. And for an individual, that's $50,800. And this slide is also in the form of a handout that I put on all your desks. Um, above is all the programs and partnerships that the city of Sioux Falls currently has. So uh, this includes um, ongoing financial support that we have to nonprofits, as well as city administered programs. And on the next slide, you'll see a breakdown of additional nonprofit support uh, within the AMI range, sorry, within the AMI range um, that is available within the city of Sioux Falls. To conclude, the 2026 Housing Action Plan offers long-term planning guidelines for addressing the housing needs of the city of Sioux Falls. Combined with consistent oversight and guidance that AHAB offers, the city creates and administers its annual action plan. The City of Sioux Falls Housing Division manages programs covering all income levels. City programs generally focus on individual project management, such as individual home or rental rehabilitation loans, home grant allocations on individual units, 0% interest loans to develop tax credit housing or individual safety grants, these individual projects tend to target households with AMIs between 30 and 
The City of Sioux Falls utilizes city and federal funding sources, including ongoing one-time funding, to partner with nonprofits that provide ongoing services, housing, and case management to households. These types of partnerships tend to target households with under 50% AMI, and most of these households are under 30%. However, the city's support for these programs is annual funding, not management of the programs itself. The city counts on its partners to administer the programs and addressing a critical area of need within the housing spectrum. The city of Sioux Falls continues to combat housing insecurity across the entire housing spectrum and actively looks for new innovative ways to address unique challenges that are presented at each income level, such as utilizing TIFs for affordable single family housing, in the future potentially rental housing, partnerships with foreign nonprofit builders, nonprofit partnerships, and innovative ways to use one time funding. However, we are limited with the effect that we can have the 30% AMI and below. Those individuals often, often require a high level of funding and more frequent ongoing connected services. I look forward to learning more from this task force about new creative solutions to these problems. With that, if any of you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Logan. Questions, comments? Kurt. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I will say this one large sheet is probably the best explanation I've heard in a long time about the programs put together. So Logan, there's two, two things that you're dealing with, current homeowners that might need some assistance, and I appreciate that. So is, do you, in your opinion, is the issue that the current housing market is not strong enough to support the population of people that cannot find homes that we're dealing with without assistance? Or is it the fact that there's not enough profit in it for a builder to build these homes going forward? I don't, from my understanding, it's really financially difficult for a builder to even build tax credit apartment projects right now and make it feasible. Um, we are working to try to find ways to be creative to make sure that more tax credit units are coming online. Uh, I, did a, I did a search a week or two ago and it looks like there's about 4,000 total tax credit units in Sioux Falls itself. Um, we're working on you know, one partnership that would add 41 extra units for starters uh, because with the increasing interest rates and the cap that the state has put on about the total tax credits that a unit can get or a apartment complex can get, Financially, there's a gap there for builders. So if we're looking at, you know, targeting, you know, below 80% AMI and capping the actual rent costs there, yeah, it's, it's really difficult for a, a, a developer to build something that, you know, they're not taking a loss on without, um, you know, tax credits and some kind of additional either zero interest loan or grant mechanism from a third party. And, and in our case, it, it would be a, a, you know, a zero interest loan. Um, and I think that that's, uh, there's some other partnerships going on for additional tax credits as well that, that are looking at the exact same thing to try to make the, try to eliminate the financial gap that they have trying to put those units up. Thank you. Mike. Yeah, um, one of the things that have happened in the past, and uh, I'm going to cite two different things. One was uh, the moving of homes from the uh, Avera, and then again the Sanford area that were moved up on, I think, like Holbrook, or not Holbrook, it starts with an H, uh, Avenue, uh, north of the penitentiary there. And then here, which is an ongoing process, uh, down in the Lada Rose yep. area, uh, are those uh, homes that have been, some of, them, of those have been relocated to the, I think it's 13th and Sneeve area. Uh, are those um, 
homes that have been moved in the re rehab arena? I missed the end of what you said there. Are those homes, those in the past and these currently that are, are being moved or will be moved, are those in the rehab er arena? They are. They're, so for the most part, what you're talking about is partnerships that we have with the Southeast Development Foundation. Um, so what they do is, in some cases, there's a there's a city support for it. In some cases, they're able to financially do it without. But the homes will be donated from school districts, Avera, Sanford. I think there's another business or two that I'm leaving out. But they'll move those homes to neighborhoods. And then, um, so Lynn Keller Forbes is the, is the head of that. And then they completely gut those houses and redo them. If they have city funding um, or if they have general ARPA funds, which is federal dollars that can be used for housing projects, um, then there'll be some AMI restrictions on there a lot of times. Um, but in, in many cases, it's they're sold for market rate, which is still in that first time home buyer price range, which the state said at 300,000 last year and increased to 340,000 this year. So. Um, Yes, they are, and, and, and we have on our website, I think that, that we just shared one of, of the projects that Lynn completed, which um, was a rehabilitation project of, of a house that actually was in a fire uh, and wasn't moved, but um, she has on her website, I believe, some other rehabilitation projects that you can look through from start to finish, and that's one of the partnerships we have, um, and we help a lot of times with the land acquisition that those houses get moved to. Thank you. Other quick, Annie. Hi, Logan. Do you know what the dollar amount is that the city gives to ICAP for these programs? I, I'm the sorry. dollar amount for to, for ICAP. So they get some home. They get home funds from the city. Let me just. I did print out. So we have uh, for the Bright Futures program. Um, which is the tenant-based rental, and it's $390,000, it looks like, for this fiscal year. Um, what about Heartland House? Is that included, or is that separate? That's general funds, and that's ongoing, and that's separate, and it's a much smaller amount. That is uh, $40,000. And then Bishop Dudley gets 100000 right? 120, yes. Oh, you upped it. Okay. And then Children's Inn? So Children's Inn, we have, that's not an ongoing funding. We have CDBG funds in over the course of three mortgages that are deferred at no interest that they don't pay on. And when they, we had that on their old uh, Children's Inn building, and we've transferred those mortgages or in the process, I should say, of transferring those mortgages um, which total, I believe it was $262,500, something within that ballpark. But there's no ongoing annual appropriation for Children's Inn. Okay. I, when I look at this graph and I look at, you know, potentially what the breakdown of, of assistance is, it, it doesn't look like the city is doing a whole ton under that 60%. AMI, that's just a comment. You don't have to answer anything there, but. And that's, again, these are generally ongoing programs that I put in this. The city has financially supported a handful of, um, just in the last five to eight years, a handful of um, uh, tax credit apartment projects that have brought hundreds of units under 80% with a good chunk of them 60 and under 40 and under as well. And that is a pretty large upfront price tag that comes back in pretty slowly. Um, but that those houses stay in affordability, I think for a minimum of 30 years. So it's, you, it's worth it in the long run to try to do a project like that, you know, year, year to year. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, the developer interested in doing them, 
um, finding a way to make the financing work from their perspective and then figuring out what kind of gap the city can help with. Yeah. And making sure that we're not, you know, what's the price per unit cost that, that you're getting, right? What, what level of subsidy um, is the city providing? It's just a, it's a balancing act there. Because I think, do you have the numbers of tax credits? Because I think most of our tax credits in the city are like between 60 and 80, aren't they? I don't have a breakdown of tax credits by AMI level. The treasury keeps that. Um, uh, I looked up the total number of units, which was I think as of December 31, 2021, 4,006. Um, I could go and see what that is, but like the most recent project we're working on has got 41 total units and I say, you know, half of them are 60% and under and there's maybe nine, 40 percent and under nine or ten um but that's off the top of my head and i've been kind of mind was bent on we'll this give you we'll give you some week. grace and let you come back with the number yeah other questions marshall thank you mr chair uh logan great job on the presentation i have been uh on this housing board for a couple of years and you did a really good job kind of summarizing and putting everything together and what all they do and what they're involved in i particularly like this um one quick question that mobile home repair program, how much has that been utilized to this point? I mean, do you, do you have a number on what kind of funds have been spent or applied for? Or? It looks like we have $50,000 budgeted for 2023. Okay. I'd have to go back and look at what we had expended in 22. Maybe at the end of the year, I can get you a more accurate number there. I, to, I should know that too, but I was thinking but it's been about that number for the last year or so where it's been about 50 grand and usually it gets used and. Yeah, okay. and again, that's that's uh, community development block grant funds that we pull for for that program. Okay. Uh, and so it's part of our annual action plan that we submit to HUD. Um, and we do have a, a city program called TOM, which is Emergency Mobile Home Buyout Demo and Relocation, uh, which essentially helps if somebody's living in a unit that is no longer livable, if they want to move out of that, they'll get fined um, by the mobile home park because the, if they leave that behind, because it'll cost them 2000 bucks to get out of it, the city will come in there and, and purchase it with city funds and just have it demoed. Right. Uh, and that's $10,000 for a budget item for next year, so it's pretty small. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have a choice and then somebody's going to put a Two thousand dollars send you a two thousand dollar bill it makes it even more difficult for you to get out of whatever cycle you're in. Right. Thank you. Any final questions for Logan? All right. Thank you. I think it would be helpful, Logan, if you could in your next run, if you could pull out those tax credit numbers for us below sixty percent, that would be appreciated. Yeah, I'll, I'll get you guys a breakdown as best as I can. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next, uh, just kind of, I think we'll tie right in a little bit, maybe, and she'll correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Michelle, on our homeless task force, Michelle, as many of you are aware, is the leader of uh, Thrive, and I've asked her to share with us as it correlates right in with our focus on housing as well and understanding the whole picture. So, Michelle, why don't you just take it over and share with us what's going on. Thank you. Thanks, Logan. This, um, the chart that you created is a masterpiece because it does explain things so clearly. I appreciate you doing that. And I appreciate you leading in so well to the things that I'm gonna talk about that you're right, that um, there are things that, that are related in everything that we do when it comes to housing. Sioux Falls Thrive was created in, um, in 2017 as uh, the Cradle to Career Workforce Initiative in Sioux Falls. We're built on a collective impact model. That means that we bring together various organizations with a common agenda. We look at shared measurements, lots of data. Um, we use Augustana Research too, and I'll talk about that just a little bit. Um, we do a lot of reinforcing activities. We make sure that those folks that are at the table are, are connected in ways that they understand and that uh, we tear down a lot of silos when we have these conversations. Uh, fourth, we have uh, 
continuous communications among these folks, their trusted relationships growing at all, at all times. And then um, when we talk collective impact, the big piece of that is a strong backbone organization. And that's what Thrive is for um, a variety of topics in Sioux Falls. We are that backbone. We provide the administrative support. We provide the facilitation for those meetings. We provide all of those things that you would need to uh, really do some innovative work in areas that are, are critical in our community. As I said, we were created in 2017. The, the topic that came up was during uh, the Sioux Falls Tomorrow conversations. There was a group of stakeholders in that um, process that was working on education and their big thing came down to we're increasingly seeing K-12 students whose um, Families are limited English, if any English, and um, their, their um, opportunities then to learn more about what might be beyond K-12 education were limited. And so um, we were created as a cradle to career organization, which means that we look at children and the ecosystems around the schools from birth till they find a job, right? And so um, we look particularly at, we're looking at early childhood right now. We're also, we make sure those benchmarks at third grade, you know, you if you aren't reading at the third grade level, when you're in third grade, you're less likely to graduate from high school. If you get to eighth grade and you're not doing eighth grade math in that, in that time period, again, your chances of graduating from high school are diminished. And so those pieces are super important to us. So again, facilitated collaboration. We bring lots of folks to the table. We look at three main topics. First is out of school time. You've heard a little bit about that. It's called, right now, the big project that's happening there is called KidLink. It's working on a neighborhood process of collaborative work and uh, looking at, again, what are the ways in these specific neighborhoods that we can build on the needs of children and um, in the areas of, again, affordable housing, food security, and out of school time. Food security then, um, outcomes have been included. Um, you know that we have neighborhood um, food giveaways that came out of a Thrive conversation. And uh, we walked alongside Feeding South Dakota during all of that process during the pandemic. And then when we talk about um, housing, um, the housing action team has a couple of really interesting outcomes. One is called One Roof. It now, it has spun off on its own and is um, part of the uh, community outreach uh, organization here in town. One Roof really looks at, um, at wraparound services for those families that are difficult to house. Um, you know, uh, the families are, have various uh, Thing, uh, ha happenings in their lives that keep them from being really great renters and uh, One Roof really step, walks in alongside them and helps them um, be more successful. The other project that's in pilot phase for the housing action team right now is called the um, um, Housing Retention Specialist. It is housed right now at East River Legal Services, again, a pilot process. And um, what they're doing is looking at, it was created in that time before the pandemic when there was such an eviction crisis that we had more people being evicted than, than was really, it was just unbelievable to watch the numbers. And so they went in with this concept of how can we slow that process down? How can we, again, put a barrier in there so that folks are less likely to be evicted and so that housing housing retention specialist will works in concert with those um, uh, property managers and the tenants themselves agree to be part of the project and if they get to a point where they've missed those folks who are um, in the program if they've missed one month's payment the housing retention specialist steps in at that point and starts mediation with them. So they don't get to that three month period and get evicted. And um, what, and we're seeing tons of success with that. It is, as I said, a pilot program, but it's something that we're talking about seriously, one, replicating, but two, creating a, a home for it as well. So it comes out of that pilot phase and because, becomes a program that we can really be proud of in this community. And then current work, and that's why Rich really asked me to talk today, 
is about, and you'll remember when Logan talked to you on this, this chart that we have, he talked to you about tax credit apartments that are in that 30 to 60% AMI. And one of the, one of the big barriers to building uh, either rental or home, home ownership properties is that those tax credit apartments there, there continues to be a gap in the, fund, in the funding. You can put together as a developer all sorts of different pieces and parts, little tools here and there, but there will still be a gap. And it, it is just virtually, at this point, virtually impossible to build a tax credit apartment building. And so um, about 10 years ago, there was, well, it was the, the Homeless Advisory Board that um, Logan referenced before the Accessible Housing um, advisory board was created. The homeless advisory board had that long-term goal of ending homelessness in Sioux Falls in, in a 10-year period of time. One of the pieces that that team looked at heavily was what's called a housing trust fund. It didn't really get any traction 10 years ago, but many of the folks who were involved with that effort at that time are now members of the housing action team with Sioux Falls Thrive. We, um, that team is represented by the Helpline Center, by uh, our Regional Director of Housing and Urban Development, the HUD. Um, we have uh, Affordable Housing Solutions is there. Um, several um, long-term landowners, landlords, um, a couple of um, uh, developers, nonprofit developers are on that team. And they're all adamant, Logan's on the team now too, we're really grateful that he's um, stepped in to help us think about this. And Andy, I just begged him to come in because we needed a finance guy to help us think this through. Because that's the whole point of an action team is that we're, we're ready to take action and we have to get to that point where we have the right people at the table to have this. It's a difficult com conversation to have. And so, um, the housing action team is taking that idea of a housing trust fund and what it would do, and we're gonna define that as part of this conversation. Because remember, collective impact, we're coming together, common agenda, gotta figure out the answers as we work through it. So this team of volunteers, and, and we'll be looking for a couple of others still, because um, we continue to ask ourselves, do we have the right people at the table for this project? And I think there are a couple of people that are still, still missing from that. Um, so it'll be in, it's really gonna be in three um, phases is the way that, that I think that it's gonna come down. We're gonna address that, that concept of, if you remember on Logan's slides, that, that economic disparity that we have in Sioux Falls, we continue to increase the one side of the chart where the income numbers in this town are going up. We have more people making more money on that sort of right side of the chart. But on the left side of the chart, those numbers continue to hold steady. That we continue to have the same numbers of people who are low income or super low income. And, and I use those rather than the numbers, but it's around that 30% AMI number. People that have four people in their family are making less than $30,000 a year. And in between there, between there and 30, between 30 and 60% AMI, those tax credit apartments, we continue to have that same number of people. And, and Logan's right, it's about 4,000 tax credit units in town right now. We have a need for at least that many, if not more, to be built in the community. And we still need that concept of how do you fill the gap in funding. What our developers find is that those federal dollars come with a lot of strings. The point of a housing trust fund then is to put local control into that process so that we're not reliant so much on factors outside our community determining what we should build and who we should build it for, where we should build it, that we take back that control as a community. And it will involve, obviously, philanthropic emphasis. We're going to have to ask people for money. We, we know that one of the reasons this concept failed 10 years ago was that we had proposed a, a, a potential extra bit of a sales tax and that doesn't fly well in this community. But we're a super generous community and we know that this is something that we can make happen between philanthropy and grants and various organizations that this will come together. So in a nutshell, I know I've talked a long time, 
three phases. One, we're in the first phase right now. We really are um, laying out the groundwork for how this is gonna happen. And then in the spring, we will have a couple of big community meetings. We know that we have a lot of people at the table already, but we're going to bring the entire community into that conversation so that everyone understands where we're headed and has input on what it means to build a housing trust fund in Sioux Falls. And then the third phase will be that truly strategic planning, develop, you know, based on the data analysis that we'll be doing in between. And we'll be, we'll be doing, again, those collective impact conversations around this big, big topic. So um, it really is, again, about bringing local control into that um, funding mechanism so that we can set up a system that works for us as a community and... Uh, and we can make a difference for some of those folks that are truly, truly in those lower income brackets. Those, those folks that when Rich and I talked about it the other day, he said, you know, realize those are people that don't make even $30,000. And I hadn't really thought about it that way. When you look at, you say 30% AMI or 60% AMI, those are interesting numbers, but you don't, they don't have any context. When you talk about a family of four, you think about a mom, a dad, or a couple of adults and a couple of kids, or a mom and three kids living on $27,000 a year, I couldn't do it. Not sure you could. So um, that's where we're headed. Happy to answer questions. I know it's sort of high level right now, but that's the whole point. We're starting a community conversation around a housing trust fund. And uh, you can Google housing trust fund and each one of them is, has some similarities, but um, they're different um, depending on the community. And the other thing that I didn't say is that Rapid City has started theirs and they have written their first two loans. They're fully funded at this point. And so that kind of gets my back up a little bit because I'm kind of competitive and especially when it's Rapid City, I kind of want to be better than them. I don't know, it's a thing. But there are several communities in South Dakota that are headed down the same path and, and we need to be there as well. So that's what we're doing. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Be careful Googling housing trust fund. You might find yourself at 3 a.m. reading lots of stuff. About it's a rabbit different, hole. Different cities. Questions for Michelle on the housing trust fund or the work that they're doing in the housing area specifically? Kurt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Michelle, I have two quick questions. The housing retention specialist who says the pilot program, how is that funded? Right now it's under a Bush grant um, that it actually, so it lives at East River Legal Services, the money is at um, the Community Foundation, and then the Housing Action Team kind of oversees that role. Um, so yeah, it's a big collaboration. Uh, second, your Housing Trust Fund, what kind of money are you talking about? No idea. Bajillions. That's the really technical term for it, bajillions of dollars. Yeah. No, I, at, in Rapid City, they have five million in hand and they're doing it as a low interest revolving loan fund. So, mm -hmm. Terry. Uh, thank you, Michelle and Jacob. Logan, sorry about that. <clears throat> it is a lot of high level stuff to wrap your mind around, but I really appreciate you, Michelle, painting a picture a little bit more of exactly what we're talking about when we hear those numbers. I can't help but to harken back to my single parent home of six, where my mother, I'm sure, never cleared over $30,000 in her lifetime. And um, just thinking about, is that my still on here? It kind of went away. Too close? Hello? All right. Um, I just don't know how she pulled that off and what I do know is some of the things that she was left with considering as options in order to make ends meet. And it's so interesting because I was just having a conversation with my board of directors about ways we want to fill the gap and one of the members talked about again the options that are left with children and families for them to step up and help out their moms and their families when those financial strains are known, apparent, and evident. Um, I think about my brother who went to prison three times um, because of drug distribution. But one thing we know, I know about crime and people who have committed crime is they're well-intended people. So people end up committing crime, earning income illegally in order to fill the gaps that we know are there. And so I just think it's, it would be imperative for us to think about how this gap leads to crime and how in filling that gap helps us to reduce crime therefore by making us having not only a safer community but 
you know, something we can be proud of as we are looking to be more equitable and realize the disparities that are out there. And so tough time wrapping my mind around all the percentages and the benefits and the incentives to developers and all those things. But one thing I know for sure is what it felt like to be a youth in a single parent home of six where my mother made less than $30,000 and some of the consequences that therefore happened in my family um, because of that strain. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Gary, you know, then once you are convicted of a crime, that puts you in a separate category too. There's certain housing that's not available to you. Whether you have children or not, you can be a family of one or a family of 50. You can't go into certain housing if you're a convicted felon, which creates a whole different rabbit hole for folks to have to consider. Yep, good feedback. Other questions for Michelle? Mar Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, nice job, Michelle. You sure have a lot going on, you and your team, and lots to work on with this. I was kind of taking notes a little bit, but I didn't quite catch it. How does that One Roof program work? One Roof now is in the um, community outreach organization, and it provides wraparound services. It Actually, they're running it in conjunction with Bright Futures, which is on your chart. So that it, depending on the specific needs of that family, um, they provide um, down payments for a rental, you know, if you, you need your first and last month's rent or whatever it is that's needed for specific families that are particularly difficult to house. Okay. Interesting. Thank Terry. You. Terry. I could actually speak to it. I'm the, uh, on the board of directors for the Community Outreach Center, uh, currently serving as the chair. And so just that fund, it includes, so the wraparound services include the fact that we do mentorship programming as well for those residents. Um, we have the, the home owner towards home ownership program like Hezekiah House. So it's just trying to work with those one roof clients to not only establish stability, but then actually help them with the life skills and the budgeting support that comes with Genesis, possibly moving into ownership with Hezekiah. But essentially the fund allows for us to cover the cost of any damages that would be incurred um, from lost rent or damages from those tenants when they're in the one roof program. Great. It's really that concept of it's difficult as a landlord to rent to folks that, that you know maybe have a past for some reason. And so this program helps those folks get in with landlords and, and pays for the things that, that may be the issues that might be created by housing someone like that. Well, and I think one of the key points to that was that they actually recruit landlords and they have a, a pocket of landlords that will actually forego some of their background stuff in order to work with these clients that need a second chance renters. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate all the information and good work. Uh, next on our agenda, at our last meeting, one of the items that came up that, you know, we talked about maybe being something very specific and tactical that we could had conversation or, or work towards is the issue of identifications and uh, helping in that process. Andy Patterson volunteered to just kind of do some legwork and look at the issue of getting IDs in our community. And he just wanted to share for a moment this morning, this afternoon on where we're at in that conversation. Andy? Yeah, uh, thanks, Rich. Um, yeah, I had some good conversations, frankly, learned a lot, like every meeting for those of us that don't live this all the time. Um, I think first off, Remind yourself why are ID cards a thing? It seems like a small thing, but really, how can you get much done if you don't have one? Uh, getting a job, uh, getting benefits. So it, it's sort of like probably first step or early step in case management. Um, and, and I think the thing that I was hearing here that caused me to bring it up were how many different entities that, that are working on that, especially that relates to our homeless population. Um, Caden, I'm gonna kinda put you on the spot if you don't mind. Um, and visiting with Caden, um, her work while she was at Bishop Dudley House has seen this up close and has done some, some work and I, I think some really cool mo momentum in that space. Would you mind taking that for a second? Um, so while I was working at the Bishop Dudley House, I realized that the number one barrier standing between a lot of our clients um, and getting housing, a job, education, or a bank account was that they couldn't afford a state ID. Um, and 
the bleeding heart that I am, said, well, I can just pay for a bunch of those. So I paid for about 10 of them before Madeline found out and told me I couldn't do that anymore. But we luckily found a grant and um, it was really small to start. It was $1,000. And we worked with guests at the Bishop Dudley House. We had um, very minimal criteria. They had to meet with a case manager a couple of times. Um, they had to have not a reason to get an ID because you don't need a reason, you just need one to exist, but it was expedient if they had a job interview coming up or if they needed it for some legal reasons. Um, and that $1,000 grant carried us through about two and a half months of providing individuals with IDs at the Bishop Dudley House. And through those IDs, we were also able to get those individual social security cards um, and birth certificates. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's there's some discussion about a bill at the legislature. Could you hit on that? Um, that was actually just the reason I decided to run for office. Um, I would like to bring a bill, uh, in the, if I win, uh, to make state IDs free for people below the poverty line across South Dakota. Um, even if I'm not chosen to represent at the state legislature, Ronald Nesaba and a few other legislators have agreed to bring the bill forward. So in theory... By this time next year, we could be providing state IDs across South Dakota for everyone below the poverty line. So Rich, just to maybe add one thing. So I think that's really helpful. Um, maybe one observation that bigger than ID cards, because um, it, it was like once I had thought, ab thought about these, like Rich is texting me pictures of stuff, there were other places doing ID cards that, and you realize the reason why the discussion is that's like one of the first steps if you have a case manager. And um, I think one of the things that, that's kind of hitting me is the Community Foundation had gotten some money to Madeline a year or so ago to help with this issue, realizing there are a lot of people in homelessness at Bishop Dudley that need ID cards, which me, the tell there is they're not getting case management um, somewhere else. They're somewhere falling between the cracks of the other maybe more traditional case managers. And so while I'm excited, there's some ideas for ID cards, I think we might want to dig and say, who doesn't have a case manager there, someone who's helping them not be there? Um, and so that, that's just maybe the observation I think would be great to, to dig more into. And I, you guys all know my, my knowledge here is limited, but I, I do think that there's an opportunity to say, how come some of the people that have been there for a while aren't being served that way? Great. Thank you, Andy. Questions for Andy on his research and full knowledge? The ID thing is a real thing. And you know, you, um, for whatever reason, a backpack gets stolen, lost, soaked, and your ID's gone, you really are at a standstill. There are many states and communities around this country that if your address is a homeless shelter, you can get a state ID at no charge. So it's not big, huge, consequential legislation that we have to get figured out. It's it's really pretty straightforward work. And um, other communities have figured out, I think we can figure that out as well. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for that. And, uh, oh, Terry. Uh, just some of my background, we're working with uh, the justice impacted out of jails and prisons. One of the things I've heard several times before, and I think it's just a place for accountability, is to do more questioning on how property is lost while they're incarcerated. Um, so to hear a story of, I had it when I was arrested and now I'm being released and they no longer possess it, I've never received any answer or how real or unreal that is, but I've heard that story many times. And so I just think as far as this, an accountability and the city of Sioux Falls in regards to, you know, county. I um, actually checked into that, Terry, because I worked with a lot of people that would say the same thing. And they said, well, they do confiscate it if it's expired or they're not supposed to have it because it was revoked, something like that. So there could be some truth to that. Um, well, I'm glad you did the research. I was going to assign more to Andy, so oh. good. <laughs> well, and also with the IDs, I mean, Minnehaha County does pay for IDs and birth certificates in certain circumstances. Um, it's The fee goes to partially the county and then partially the state. Um, so I think for the birth certificate anyway. Um, 
I think it could be possibly um, for the birth certificate, we could potentially do some sort of fee waivers with the state and the county or something in order to get those. I don't necessarily think that we have to have a law change. I mean, maybe we do. Um, but for the IDs, that's a true statement. Um, when I re researched it, um, New Jersey, I, they do free ones for homeless. Um, right now we do uh, free birth certificates for uh, people who wanna play baseball, um, but not for people that actually need it to get an ID and a job and housing and, and all the other things. So um, I think there might be a few different ways to do this. Um, I know New Jersey, they put a, a stipulation that you could only get like two or three freebies in your lifetime because if you're transient, you're probably gonna lose them. So then they decided they needed to put a cap on it. Um, but I'm wondering if there's a way for us to do something like they do with DD-214s and have them on file with the Register of Deeds so that when somebody gets an ID or a birth certificate, they can be on file so that if they lose them, they can just go there and get a copy. I don't know, but there's opportunities for different things. I would just add one thing. I, I think the cost, I, I've never done this, but in my mind, the cost of paying for it is one obstacle. The guide to help you apply is the other part of it. And I think we need to keep an eye on that as well, that money might be the easiest part. It's someone that can fill out the paperwork that has the bandwidth to do that. Sounds good. But more, more to come there. Thank you, Andy. And Annie, thank you for your constant wisdom and so forth. So, you know, we've come a long ways here, I think. Um, the last couple of meetings, we've learned a lot. We've shared a lot of information. And so kind of been wrestling with how do we move forward as a task force? What's the next step that we took take? So I, I took some liberties as the chairperson of saying, let's maybe put together a, a draft framework of how we move forward. Um, we've all been seeing lots of information. Over the last couple of weeks, we've had a small group, Caden, uh, Annie, Terry, Mike, myself. We've met two other times for a total of over four hours talking deeper and other things about it as well. And so what I've done is I've dra drafted, I want to emphasize, draft an initial framework of potential recommendations we would consider making to the mayor and the city council. This is meant to be a starting place, or as somebody mentioned to me on the phone, this is really a launch pad of sorts that after listening to the informal research group and many of you, I tried to put together some items that would allow this group to kind of come together and really discuss some meat on the bone. So look at this as just an idea, kind of something to focus us. We might, two weeks from now, three weeks from now, this might look completely different. It might look edited or whatever. And so I just wanted to go through some things that I've been hearing as common themes and issues that have risen up in multiple conversations and so forth. The first one that comes up as one I think we've heard consistently is we want to think about promoting an intentional, proactive, and healthy approach to engaging with homeless on the streets. The conversation that the informal research team really had was, we need to do something besides be reactionary. Uh, you know, we, we can't wait until 911 is called. Uh, we want to be really healthy in our community of how we're moving people into a continuum of care, not just dealing with a person that's on the street. And so we want to put people in a continuum of care. What can we do proactively to help others? So I think potential, there's two things in here that have been identified as potential actions. One is, is for the city to enter into a contract for professional services with Urban Indian Health for a two-year pilot project of a street outreach team. South Dakota Urban Indian Health is in process working down this road, looking at other cities such as Denver and Rapid City and the work that they've done on this front. You know, something I'm not sure how this isn't the best thing to share, but I think it needs to be shared publicly. Now, the most recent number I've heard could be wrong on this. The most recent number I've heard is that 78% of our homeless community in Sioux Falls is Native American community. Um, that's a disproportion beyond except a bit, way beyond accept, acceptability. Um, and so I think it's right in front of us that we need to work with an intentional Native American uh, focus community. And so there's an opportunity to really partner with South Dakota Urban Indian Health. So that's a potential action item. Another action item that's come up that I've heard in multiple conversations from multiple of you and the informal research team, plus some outside entities is, there's a feeling that we need to create a public education campaign to help really the community understand what's going on with homelessness and what's healthy approaches to helping people when they see someone panhandling and so forth and helping the community maybe develop a holistic understanding of how they should approach that versus, hey, let's just get individuals off of the street in front of us. And so there's been a lot of conversation of should we have some sort of public education campaign. So number one is 
potentially intentional approach to conversing with people on, on the streets. The second item is, is it's become clear that we need to review the loitering ordinance with law enforcement, city attorney's office, and other impacted individuals. I think we had the city attorney come and talk at one of our meetings and all of us were probably just Google-eyed or whatever by the end of that of all those red circles that he had on the PowerPoint and so forth. There's layers of complication on this when it comes to the Constitution and other laws and stuff, but we at least need to have a formal conversation about some of the, specifically there's streets addressed in our loitering ordinance, so those need to be updated to reflect the more current operations of our community. And so we probably need to recommend, potentially recommend that the council conduct a thorough review with the chief of police, city attorney, and others to determine if a loitering ordinance needs to be updated. The third item is what we already talked about here just for a few moments. Is there a potential to collaborate with others to simplify the process and create consistent access for people to get needed identification? So at the moment, haven't heard a specific council action that we could recommend that would be to be determined, but hearing it as a priority that we want to continue to talk about. Fourth thing really came out of our last meeting and has come out of other conversations as well. I think what I've heard at least in the community and, and again could be wrong is we want to focus not on really another shelter or more shelters. We want to focus on kind of the continuum of care over the long haul. So this idea of saying, can we enter into formal planning with the county to strengthen our housing first approach with wraparound services to grow over the next three years? Say, hey, there's been a lot of good work done with the safe home. Other programs are thing, but with our growing community, looking as Michelle has already pointed out, some of those numbers that have just stayed exactly where they're at, do we need another double down intentional effort on that? So we could recommend to the council that the council enters into a formal agreement with the county to really pursue another round here of how we establish and do continue the great work that's already been done in, in many ways. Fifth item is, I think, has come forth from multiple conversations and from our last meeting as well as an agreement to say we need to encourage community-wide participation in the Helpline Center's network of care. The Helpline has become a respectable, not just Sioux Falls leader, but really statewide leader as well. And so what can we do as a community to make sure they exist for the public good? We need to make sure our other non Profits are utilizing them for the public non-good as well, public good as well, excuse me. So there's two council actions that we could potentially recommend here. First, the recommendation that we establish a fund with the Sioux Falls Community Foundation to incentivize nonprofits. We all know the reality of financial challenges with nonprofits and with the new work that the helpline is doing to make everything HIPAA compliant and also just meet people where they're at with the current database that they have. We need to help remove that financial burden for nonprofits, maybe over a three year period, say first year we cover 100%, next year's 70%, third year's 30%. Just giving an example of how we help nonprofits kind of uh, on ramp into the program. Uh, the other item on this, after talking with the helpline, is maybe potentially we offer some money to the helpline themselves. They've had to update in order to become HIPAA compliant. And so over the next three years, could we provide a grant to them to really help with that big step that, that they've taken as well? And then the second draft item on here is, should we encourage the council to host a roundtable discussion with other key leaders across the city, county, and state regarding database operations and the continuum of care? Sioux Falls is not on an island. Uh, we interact with the rest of the state all of the time. And so what do we need to do with the state in regards to coordinated entry, the health system as well, to make sure that we're talking locally with what's going on in the state and encourage that participation as much as possible and so forth. So those are five overarching priorities. Under those priorities, just put some potential specific council actions under them that we could recommend. Then there's been three other specific things that have come up, I think, in almost every conversation in some format. But under the spirit of collaboration, I think we're all in agreement on this task force that none of us want to duplicate what's going on in the community, that we believe collaboration is the key. And so there's three big items that we not recognize our priorities, but there's things happening. So for example, we've all realized that Mental health is a, is a huge growing challenge in our community and specifically within the homeless population, how do we care for those who are struggling with mental health issues? Um, there's a variety of things we could pursue, but what's become clear, we had a meeting, the link is currently undergoing strategic planning. And I think before jumping into you know, solutions of where we should go with the mental health the link was established by the community, city, county, Avera, Sanford, um, 
They're, we should let them finish their strategic planning before we stick our fingers and start moving things around, et cetera. And so that's been identified, a common theme. The other thing that's been a common theme, we've heard about it, spent a lot of time on it, is how do we provide shelter specifically for homeless families? And then also the expansion of continuing to meet the capacity needs of existing shelters. There's discussion already underway with multiple organizations about what opportunities exist with the current children's in facility to house homeless families. Uh, that discussion's underway with these nonprofits. And I think from the conversations I've been a part of and engaged, maybe messes things up for us to engage in those conversations. Again, let those conversations move forward. If they come to us and ask for support, ask for our perspective and guidance enter into, but I again don't want to interrupt good community collaboration and conversation that's already going on. But I think what I've heard is this is absolutely a priority. If those conversations weren't be happening, I think this would be on the other side of the paper where we'd be encouraging council action. But since conversations are already happening and plans are already happening, we want to listen to those plans. The other thing that's come up multiple times, we heard it again today, is we need to establish intentional and persistent effort to create more housing units under 60% average median income. This is a huge topic that's been talked about for years in Sioux Falls. Uh, we could have a 40-page report on this alone. I think there's been multiple 40-page reports on this al alone. But recognizing two things are really substantial here of why in the draft recommendations there hasn't been something. Number one is Thrive's Housing Action Team has formed and discussing specifically a trust fund. And then secondly, I think we've heard today the leadership of Logan on the Accessible Housing Advisory Board. That advisory board has gone through a little bit of multiple iterations with different staff from the city. At least from my perspective, we've got stabilized staff in place now. I think us jumping back in that conversation with Ahab, I, I hate to throw a wrench into kind of how they've reestablished and are moving forward, and they're looking at multiple opportunities as well. So it's going to be one of those things where if they were doing nothing, it'd be like council, do something. But uh, we see that's going on. We don't necessarily want to jump in again as well. So I just wanted to, what I wanted to do today, my goal was this. Put a draft in front of you and say, hey, over the next couple of weeks, let's beat this thing up. Let's edit it. Let's subtract it. Let's add to it, et cetera. But give us a place to start so that we could have a conversation together as, as a group. And so what I wanted to propose today was number one is this. Does this make sense? to kind of use a draft like this to move the conversation forward. And then secondly, if it does make sense, how we want to move forward in that conversation. So I want to stop there and provide the opportunity for you to ask questions of clarification. I don't want to get in today to debating each point and, and all of the practical things of it, the overarching process and, and thought. Questions, comments? Michelle. Um, two comments, or two questions, I guess. and. I asked um, Maddie Miller of, at the link the, about this the other day, and the presence of Southeastern Behavioral Health at the link, um, I think should be part of the, uh, first of all, let me say, I love that you've given us this beginning. I, I appreciate that tremendously. It helps so much to, because we have said all of these things. So my question then is about, I think urban Indian health is a great idea, but I just want to make sure that in our conversations, we also say, we know Southeastern is there for a couple hours a week. Let's make sure we're not stepping on toes there, right? Yes, great. And then my that. other one is, it's number five on the front page for what we have. I just want to make sure that we, um, I know that Annie is involved with the continuum of care stuff on the state level. So I want to make sure that we're also not duplicating things there. But I also know that that, again, in my own parlance is, kind of messed up. There's some things that are missing when it comes to that. So, no, I appreciate this tremendously. Thank you. And I think um, Rich hit on it when he put and state database operations. So I think, okay. yeah, to be continued. Well, that's, that's a big conversation because these databases do not talk to each other. And the Bishop Dudley House just had a meeting with the state last week and it's it's disappointing um, because we're we meaning Bishop Dudley House is on the Sioux Empire Network of Care at the encouragement of our benefactors and our stakeholders in the community. Unfortunately, that system, while great and very robust, 
does not work with what the state system is and what they're required to do under HUD. And it's just not as simple as just let's create some software. It's actually there's people that have to sit and spend hours each week where we could be serving people instead of entering information into a database. Yep. Yeah, and I think as we continue this piece of the conversation, some of that mm. will develop. I mean, I'm all for giving additional funds to 211 to do some of this stuff. So um, I did have a comment, though, because I think on one hand, we talked about, you know, we don't want any more shelters, but then we have a group that's creating another shelter. So I, it's maybe not our place to do anything with that, but it's interesting to note. Yes. Kurt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On your number two, review the loitering ordinance. I've already had that meeting with the city attorneys uh, a couple of weeks ago. They are in the process right now reviewing what can and can be done with that. They certainly have some concerns with the current loitering ordinance, so they're going to get back to us hopefully within the next couple of weeks. You know how Perfect. fast attorneys move. I hope we could get it done. <laughs> Perfect. Terry. <clears throat> Thank you, Rich, for putting this together. Um, yeah, I really appreciate seeing everything that is here. One of the things I, I would draw attention to is just that when you think about the reports from like Madeline and being at capacity, when you think about the, the initiative of how do we engage homeless people on the street, and really, really almost a unanimous consensus that we want to see people housed. I mean, it's not pleasant, enjoyable, and it breaks hearts to see people that, for whatever reason, are still on the street. And it was very interesting to hear from um, the director at the link and really have her support the harm reduction model to say that um, complete sobriety is not the goal. Um, if people are walking themselves back into agencies to get help again, um, that in itself is a win. And when you look at the amount of usage that the link is seeing from, you know, 10 people about, you know, utilizing over 50% of the, what they're doing, if we can collectively come up with a new housing first program, I mean, we really do uh, make a significant impact and reduce the burden of capacity on places like the link or um, the Bishop Dudley. So I just think it just makes sense from that, thinking about this from a harm reduction model, um, you know, the complexity of addiction and how um, it's tough to just escape from. Um, and so having a safe place for people who are in transition to manage and maintenance their addiction and mental health issues, um, I definitely am in full support of and think it's an appropriate conversation to continue to have. Mike. Uh, first of all, um, the only thing that I just kind of jumped out at me was the very last item with the 60% AMI, and I'm not about to be so facetious as to throw a different figure at you right at the moment, but on the other hand, as one of those individuals that unfortunately is older than anybody else on this panel, I have uh, uh, gone through a lot of different decades where things have changed. Uh, I, for one, Michelle, don't think I've ever made $30,000 in one year. So uh, that be that as it may. Um, that's something I think that we should at least have a discussion on so far as the percentage on that. Uh, also, having been one of those that uh, has been homeless, I've never actually saw anybody homeless hanging around wherever who's making $30,000 a year. I mean, you know, just a, a thought process for you to make. Um, thank you. Well, if we're in general agreement kind of with at least having something to work from, my question would be is, would you be in agreement to say, uh, hey, over the next two weeks, 
Jim and I would get this posted online and then create an electronic place where you could kind of give feedback, add to it, edit it, et cetera. And then what we would do in two weeks, Jim and I would take that feedback, create another one of these a week in advance of our next meeting. So we'd meet in three weeks over the next two weeks, would ask all of you to really commit some time personally to getting in there, digging, feedback, et cetera. That would give Jim and I a couple of days to edit it, get it back to you for a week in advance. Then that next meeting, we'd come back together and really kind of work it out together publicly. We could share our opinions, perspectives, et cetera, after you've had some time to wrestle with it, share your ideas and so forth. How does that sound as a potential pathway to move forward on this? Yeah, I think it sounds great, and I really do appreciate these drafts, something that we can finally kind of look at and work off of and sharpen as we go. So nice job with that. So if there's no objections, we'll move forward with that, and I would say probably in two days, Jim will be emailing everybody with kind of directions of how you can view it and where you can give electronic input, et cetera, and, uh, and then we'll get a meeting scheduled for about three weeks from now as well. So really appreciate I know it's a big time commitment that people have made on this front. Members of the public, there is, uh, this is available at the table on the screen somewhere out there if you want to grab one of those on your way out. Again, it is a draft, draft piece. Any final comments on that process moving forward? Smart remarks, all right. Uh, members of the public, this is your opportunity to uh, address the task force if there's anything discussed today or other perspectives. Uh, perspectives that you'd like the task force to consider. This is your opportunity. Each member of the public can have up to three minutes to share their ideas or perspective with the task force. Come on forward if you'd like to share something. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Ian Grove. It's nice to see all of you. Thanks for all your hard work regarding this uh, really complex subject. Um, I just want to offer a couple suggestions. Um, I came in late, so I didn't catch everything that was said. But regarding the IDs, I don't think the IDs, is, you know, it's a panacea. But um, we need them. People need them greatly. And uh, I just wanted to say that, as a matter of policy, most penal institutions require inmates to have ID in place before they're released. So that may be something that you can look at. Um, is this happening in county jails? Is this happening in state jails? Uh, any kind of uh, facility that's holding people. Um, I'd say even uh, juvenile facilities as well. You know, that'd be a good place. Um, every time you come in contact with a person at the link, for instance, that'd be a great time to just ensure that their ID is in place. And then we have these digital formats. So we have files that can be kept now and, and transferred around. And I know there are HIPAA concerns with some of this stuff, but uh, they are available and they're transferable. Um, between different sort of case management uh, databases and things like that. So if we can keep somebody's uh, credentials on, online and available, they'll be available everywhere all the time. You know? And I think that's pretty much it. Oh, also, uh, regarding the urban Indian health street teams, uh, please don't overlook the street teams that are already in place. So there are community health workers that are actually deployed into the streets currently uh, through places like Union Gospel Mission. Now they're doing good work, connecting people to services, getting them into facilities and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Phyllis Aarons again. Um, again, thank you. This has been a monumental undertaking for all of you, I'm sure. Um, again, I just want to encourage you to remember that in this whole process, don't forget we're talking about someone's mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter. They're not just a body on the street to um, cause difficulty for someone else. They're someone's family member and hopefully they still have someone who loves them. I've known too many whose families have given up on them, but we need to just remember again that there's, um, people first. And because so many, as Madeline said the last time, who are at Bishop Dudley and have mental health problems, we cannot, you know, expect somebody who has a serious mental illness to follow directions and take care of issues the way the rest of us was do. 
um, and I loved talking about case managers. Again, we need a transitional living facility. I firm believer in housing first, but some place where they can live for, you know, six months to 18 months or whatever and relearn how do you make a meal? How do you go get groceries? How do you clean the toilet? And learn those skills so they can transition into their own apartment. But even when they transition, they are still going to need case management to make sure that they're taking the garbage out, that the neighbors aren't complaining about them. So yes, we need this whole continuum of care so that they can live independently. Um, oh, and then somebody talked about loitering. And I'll bet you, once we can get people living successfully in the community, we're not going to have to worry about loitering. That might just take care of itself. So um, again, thank you so much for your work. I look forward to seeing how it all shakes out. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Anybody else wish to give input today? Going once, twice. All right. Our next, our next meeting will be on October 24th at 4 p.m. October 24th at 4 p.m. Uh, at the next two weeks, really would ask each of you task force members to spend some individual time digging in here and giving your feedback, perspective on this draft, editing it, and so forth. So thank you for your participation and look forward to seeing you in three weeks. Have a great night, everybody.